Good morning, and thank you for turning into Facebook Live to hear my story. My name is Eric Rauscher, and I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. Today, I'm going to share my story of the Rauscher and Eisner history of how good life was in Europe until. I do want to remember my brother Russell Rauscher, my first cousins Hannah Deitch and Steve Eaton. This story is a bit different than some that you may have heard already, is unlike uh, many stories. My family uh, was not in, were not in concentration camps, but it's very unique as they were able to make their way to the United States through Manila. After, during this presentation, we'll also then take you to a journey back to their homeland. During this presentation, if you do have any questions, put them in the chat line and we will answer them at the end of this presentation. So my father, Walter, died young and he was never able to record his story. Fortunately, with the documents, photos and eight millimeter films that he took, I'm able to share his story as a child of a Holocaust survivor. Our families always told stories of their life in Czechoslovakia, the general store they owned, the farmland they tended, the friends and family they had, the travels they had, uh, generally speaking, life for them was good as it was for many Europeans at that time. Now pictured here, just like any other young man or a young lady, Walter's uh, bar mitzvah picture, classroom picture, and he was a pretty good athlete. Pictured here is uh, Walter on a soccer team. He was on a travel soccer team and he was fortunate enough to travel through Europe uh, with his soccer team. I need to explain and introduce you to some of the family members that we will be talking about. My great grandparents, Adolf and Anna Rauscher. My grandparents, Oscar and Clementine Rauscher, their children, Walter and his sister, Irma. Walter married Elaine, Irma married Leo Eisner. And when they came to America, they changed their name to Eaton. Why did they do that? They did not want a Jewish sounding name. Each of them had children, and then we had children as well. Now, the Rauscher family home was in a town in, uh, called Ocheline, about an hour and a half drive from Prague. It was in a little uh, village, and it was on, near the German border in an area called the Sudetenland. It's a beautiful town with rolling hills, as my father would describe it. Now, pictured here is the general store. And on the lower level was the store and the upper level is their living quarters. And in front of the house, we've got a picture of Oscar, Clementine, Irma, and Walter. Those general store owners, not everybody was able to pay their bill all at once. So they would keep a ledger. People came in, they had a little money, they would pay it off. Now they saved this ledger and it was always upsetting and depressing to them. Many, many of these debts were never collected as they had to leave, but they were able to save their lives. I'm about ready to show you an eight millimeter film. This goes on for about three and a half minutes because of time, I can't show the whole film, but pictured here, you're gonna see Walter, Clementine, and Irma. And I'm sorry. So in this film, you're gonna see also, you can see their lives were pretty good. They had a film projector, camera, that's Irma and Leo. And you can see they were smiling, they were happy, and they knew life was changed, changing. So they documented everything, including their father's grave as he passed away in 1936. Now, I'm gonna keep this going just for a minute so you can also see my cousin Hannah, who was born in Czechoslovakia, and then we'll move on. Now, fortunately, they were able to keep these memories, and, but they had to leave everything behind, but they saved their lives. So here you see Irma, and you can see with her newborn in a second, her daughter, Hannah. But then life changed. And this is a patch that was recently donated that I donated to the Illinois Holocaust Museum. 
And in 1933, Nazis seized power and they demanded the return of the Sudetenland. Now, why did they demand it? Well, after World War I, the Armistice Agreement took a portion of Germany, which was the Sudetenland, and it then became Czechoslovakia. Hitler wanted it back. In 1938, he threatened war unless the Sudetenland was ceded back to Germany. The leaders of Britain, France, and Italy went to Munich in 1938. And in September of 1938, the return of the Sudetenland uh, was given to Germany for a pledge of peace. Life under Hitler changed immediately. As a matter of fact, there were Nazi operatives in the Sudetenland prior to the Munich Agreement already harassing the Jewish population. Now, this is a map of the Sudetenland. Yet in 1939, that's early 1939, Hitler broke the Munich Accord and invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia. Of the approximately 117,000 Jews that were in that Sudetenland, most were sent to Theresienstadt, which was outside of Prague, and about 90,000 of those were then sent to Auschwitz, where 78,000 lost their lives. The pre-war population in all of Czechoslovakia was approximately 360,000. After the war, only 14,000 remained. Now I'm going to play this video clip. This is the start of an armed occupation that brings one fifth of Czechoslovakia under the German flag. triumphal crossing of the border. The dictator whose diplomatic victory won more than a war inspects his pride. Yet these scenes of jubilation mask tragedy. For while thousands are cheering here, other thousands are in flight. A minority whose rights are totally disregarded. Here, jubilation. So I'm stopping it here. Again, time doesn't permit to see this uh, archival footage. But as it points out, the Nazis are celebrating at the plight of the Jewish population who was just forced from their homes. My cousin Steve was a collector. Um, he was a stamp dealer, he was a collector. And he found this postcard and, and this is propaganda that the Nazi regime put out after they seized the Sudetenland. Now, I want to note, and you will see later in this pre presentation, the area here is called Mies, and that's where the Rauscher family lived. And Wittenberg is where the Eisner family lived. And this postcard says, we thank our leader. Now this footage that you're about to see shows how horrible life was for those Jewish population that were forced from their homes. They lost their businesses. They lost their homes. Everything they cherished was gone. My father was actually chased by Gestapo on a motorcycle. Fortunately, he knew the countryside better than them. He was able to outrun them and hide from them. As you can see here, and this film was taken late 1938, 1939. They're in no man's land. They're cold. They're living in tents. Synagogue was a tent. Everyday life under Nazi rule was oppressive. Much of the Jewish population were forced into uh, refugee camps. For some reason, neither the Rauschers nor the Eisens were forced into refugee camps. Some were fortunate to get out. My father left in the fall of 1938 and went to France prior to going to his new home in Manila. Families lost their homes, their businesses, their belongings. They left their families behind, their friends behind, their pets behind, everything they cherished. But the Eisners and the Rauschers had the foresight to hide cash. Everything they owned, they had to put into two suitcases. Then late in 1939, Clementine, Irma, Leo, and their daughter, Hannah, made their way to Manila. Leo's brother, Arthur, made it to Manila after the family was there, but he left Manila to come back and fight with the French army. After, the, after France fell to the Nazis, Arthur went to England and he fought with the British army. 
Now pictured here, and this is very important to understand, is a letter. And this is the third uh, part, or the third wave of a selection process that Manila is offering for visas to Manila. And I say this carefully because it says third wave of a selection process. Now it says here, and I don't know if you can see it, but Walter Rauscher of Germany, that's because Ger the Sudetenland became a part of Germany. It is signed by McNutt. That's important to understand because that's Paul McNutt, the former governor of Indiana, who under the Roosevelt administration became a diplomat and was sent to Manila. I will expand on this a little bit later in the presentation. But he and the president of the Philippines, Manuel Quezon, came up with the idea of open doors. And my father was part of that open doors project. When my father went to France, he had to secure jobs. And he did that through a company called Levy and Bloom. They had an office in France and an office in Manila. How were they able to do this? Clementine, my grandmother's brother, my father's uncle, Leo Schnormacher, was already in Manila working in the Czech consulate. He arranged to be their sponsors, arranged for housing and jobs. My father worked at Levy and Bloom and the rest of the family came to Manila. They also worked for Levy and Bloom. Now Levy and Bloom was a company that sold sundries, that would be cosmetics, perfumes, things of that, of that nature. In Manila, life again was once again very good. Philippine, the Filipinos and the government were very good to the European Jews and they had no anti-Semitism. Now pictured here, and again, my father went to great lengths to document his, germ, his journey to Manila. This is uh, Walter on the steamship Aramis on his way to Manila. In February of 1939, uh, Walter sailed from France to Manila. And you're gonna see here again, a very short film clip of Walter on the ship and then arriving in Manila. Walter went to great lengths documenting every port he stopped at. This film goes on for approximately 30 minutes. And to our knowledge, this may be the only footage that a European refugee documented a full trip from Europe to the Philippines. Now here, you're gonna see the rest of the family, and this was in late fall of 1939 when the rest of the family arrived in Manila. And again, there's Walter and his movie camera documenting the arrival of Clementine, Irma, Leo, and their daughter, Hannah. And here they are arriving in Manila. I talked about the company they worked for, and this was Levy Bloom. My father saved his business card, uh, an exterior picture of one of the offices of Levy Bloom, a picture of the company car that he drove, and one of the clients he called on, which was Sun Drugs. Then it happened again. There was a threat of war in the South Pacific. And again, they had to leave everything behind. Now, Leo Schnormacher was a friend of General Douglas MacArthur. And with his help, they were able to immigrate to the U United States through San Francisco on the USS Taft. Now to immigrate, they needed a sponsor who provided them uh, with, with uh, a room to live in as well as jobs. Now their sponsor, lived in Cicero, Illinois, that was Henry and Camilla Beck. The father ended up driving a truck, Irma worked as a maid, Leo worked as a stock boy. They did what they needed to do. Walter eventually owned a store in, Pil in the Pilsen neighborhood, which at that time was a Bohemian neighborhood. Due to poor health, he ended up losing the store to bankruptcy. And once again, he had to start all over. What's interesting um, in this picture, everybody was smiling. My father really smiled. He was depressed. Mentally, he was never in good health. And as we look back, it may have been a form of post-traumatic syndrome. Some of the documents here are the documents he needed 
for immigration leaving the Philippines to the United States. Now, this is a picture, a still picture of uh, them on the steamship USS Taft. Pictured our Walter Elaine, I'm sorry, Walter Clementine, Irma, their daughter Hannah and Leo Eisner. It's important to note, and this is very important, that only a handful of European Jews that went to Manila were able to immigrate to the United States. And when I say a handful, only a handful, and this was prior to the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor. Now my cousin Steve was a history buff and this was a screenshot of, from the American Heroes Channel. And this shows the Japanese in Manila overtaking uh, Levy and Bloom. When the Japanese invaded the Philippines, many were forced from their homes into refugee camps. So once again, from tyranny to oppression, life was horrible for uh, the European refugees in the refugee camps. So can you imagine going from Europe refugee camps to Philippines where life was good back into refugee camps? Pictured here is a monument about 15 minutes outside of Tel Aviv. It's called the Open Doors Monument. It's in recognition of the Philippine government saving so many lives. President Manuel Quezon of the Philippines and Paul McNutt, who was a diplomat for the United States, became friends and literally over a poker game came up the idea of the Open Doors Project. Initially, over 10,000 visas were issued to European refugees but the Philippine government was still under US rule. So the US government limited those visas to 1,000 a year. Ultimately, only 1,305 European Jews made it to the Philippines. After the war, less than 1,000 remained. Today, there are over 11,000 descendants from the Open Doors Project. I wanna be clear, the irony you're gonna see, 1,305, Walter, Clementine, Irma, Leo, and Hannah are five of those 1,305. And yet, let's step forward. Who would have thought that two of those descendants, my son, Ned, and his cousin, Lisa, would then attend Indiana University and stay at the McNutt dorm? Earlier in the presentation, I said we would then take you back to a journey to the homeland. You know, my father always wanted to go back to his birthplace. Unfortunately, his health prevented him from traveling. So Steve, my cousin and I decided to live out the desire of the family and go back to the homeland. So we arranged a trip, hired a tour guide who helped us make contact with the village manager in Oshaleen. It was interesting because the village manager said, we're trying to chronicle what happened to the Jews of Oshel and bring whatever documents, pictures that you might have. So entering Oshalene, it was just as my father described it, a beautiful little town with rolling hills, beautiful cottages, and a beautiful, it was a beautiful day with blue skies. And here in, in our, um, Tour guide was here. The village manager was actually waiting for us. And uh, we got out of the car. And on our iPads were pictures of the Rauscher house. And the village manager said, turn around. Pictured here, you're gonna see in the 1930s, the Rauscher house. Again, the general store and the lower level were living quarters. Today, the Rauscher House is a post office and a community center. Some additional pictures of the front of the house, back of the house. Pictures of the back of the house where they're baling hay. Today it's used for some storage. But Steve and I wanted to document some things. We had our picture taken in front of the house. We took soil from the house. And we took this soil because we wanted to put it on the graves of our loved ones who were born in Czechoslovakia. 
So some additional pictures of how the town grew and survived the train station in the 30s, today in 2015. And then the village manager said, hey, there's a Jewish cemetery in Oshaline, would you like to go to it? Of course, we said yes. So we went up the hill and I kid you not, we were going through a field of weeds, it was knee high. We walked up the hill and sure enough, there's a cemetery. It was overgrown with weeds. But what's interesting is that this cemetery, the graves were still there. They were never desecrated by the Nazis. Why? We don't know. So we found in the cemetery gravestones of our aunts and uncles. Great grandparents, Adolf and Anna Rauscher. Pictured here are Anna and Adolf Rauscher. And in archives uh, that we recovered and saved, I found a prayer book. It was a minion prayer book of Anna Rauscher with all the yard sites or anniversary dates through the 1970s. When we left Oshaline, we actually went on the website. Much to our surprise, the front page of the dashboard of the Oshaline website, they put a picture of the Rauscher house. Pictured here is a picture of our grandfather, Oscar Rauscher. Now, prior to Oscar's death in 1936, he said he wasn't worried. After all, with the name like Rauscher in German, they won't come for me. And let me say that again, they won't come for me. He passed away in 1936 and never knew what happened. Rauscher saved everything, the death certificate of Oscar, the obituary for Oscar. And we also wanted to find his gravesite, something that our parents were never able to do during their lifetime. So pictured here is a gravestone of Oscar Rauscher. And one of the reasons we had trouble finding it when it was a Sudetenland or Germany, the town was Mies. When it turned to Czechoslovakia, they renamed the town to Strebo. So we drove up to the cemetery, opened up the cemetery doors, and sure enough, what was left of that beautiful grave, just a little plaque as this whole cemetery was desecrated by the Nazis, yet we were able to find it. Steve had the presence to take a copy of the Kaddish on his tablet. That was a prayer for the dead. We said the prayer for Oscar Rauscher something our parents were never able to do. Our journey continued to Pilsen. Pilsen is where our family spent time and attended school. In Pilsen, we happened to visit a synagogue which was destroyed by the Nazis, yet rebuilt by the European Union. In, our, in, our, in the garden was a memorial to all those that lost their lives in concentration camps. We found this stone of Alfred Rauscher Again, much to our surprise, turned out it was a cousin of ours who died in the concentration camps in 1942. When we returned, we took that soil from the Rauscher house and put it on the graves of our loved ones. We know we once again saw the smiles on their faces. There were survivors, and this picture happens to be on display at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Walter is in the middle. Ernst Weisskopf, his cousin, made it to Israel. Arthur, as we said earlier, went to Manila, came back, fought with the French army, then the British army, raised his family in Czechoslovakia, where his children now live in Toronto. As we conclude, I want to read something that was printed by Martin Niemeyer, Niemeyer, who was a prominent Lutheran pastor, who was outspoken critic of the Nazis. He spent seven years of his life in concentration camps. Yet his post-war words are remembered. First, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. 
and they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and there was no one left to speak for me. I wanna thank you for tuning in. Join us here next week, January 13th at 10 a.m. to hear the second generation speaker, Helen Hoffenberg, to share her story of her parents' survival. Please keep an eye on the Illinois Holocaust Museum's Facebook page and other social media accounts where we will post a stream of content through the weeks ahead. And thank you for your support during these extraordinary times. I believe that there are questions that appeared in the chat line and they will be read and I'll be very happy to answer these. I will turn off this presentation uh, in a second. Thank you. Hey, Eric, thank you so much. We do have a couple questions. Okay. Um, let me get this first one here. Um, when did you first uh, hear your family's story? We, my father, it's, it's interesting you say that because he closes down. They always talked about it. They talked about how wonderful their life was. Um, they talked about it a lot. And if you will, they actually, I think, begrudged us a little bit because our life was good. Although they had a good life, they lost everything. But they talked about it a lot. But as I said, my father died young and everything was put in boxes until, um, you know, we started to look at it probably about 10 years ago and donated some items. And it wasn't until a couple months ago I actually found these eight millimeter films that were 80 years old that we were able to convert to digital media. That's brilliant. And one of the questions I had actually was, uh, what was it like kind of discovering those films and, you know, finding that? It was interesting. Yeah, um, it, you know, as a, as a kid, you, you don't really pay attention. You just think, oh, okay, it was part of their life. You become a teenager and you don't think about that. As I started to become and in, in, in training to become a second generation speaker, I learned how rare it was for European Jews to immigrate to Manila, much less make it to the United States prior to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Being prompted to do research, um, I ended up getting in contact with an author of a book, uh, The Philippine Sanctuary by Dr. Bonnie Harris. She also put me in contact with Noel Eisen, who was a documentary filmmaker who actually made a documentary film about open doors. That sort of triggered my mind and some pictures. And I said, you know, I think my father used to film all this stuff. So I literally went to this cardboard box. Inside was a steel canister and inside the canister were eight millimeter films in, 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 in canisters. They were in really good shape. So when I looked at them, it brought all these memories back of my father showing these and we were able to take these film clips. Um, and as I said, the, the journey from France to Manila may be the only film that actually documents a European immigrant making it to Manila. It's amazing. Um, did you mention that he made an effort to film and kind of document as much as possible? Did you ever talk about why he chose to do that? Because not as much, you know, there isn't that much footage. The fact that the, 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 mill, the film that they took in Oshaline was for the memories. Um, they knew they weren't going to come back. So they wanted, you know, a little bit of history as they could. My assumption is that my father just liked taking film from his camera. So I don't think he realized at that time the historical uh, importance of that film. I think he just did it for the enjoyment. What's interesting is when they got on the USS Taft, there was no other documentation, no pictures, no film of them arriving in San Francisco or getting on the train to Chicago, Illinois. So I think he did it as a hobby. That's amazing. Yeah, he, he also filmed um, their life in Manila and how good life there was in Manila. Wow. Um, one of the questions we just got was um, the last picture of Ernst, Walter and Arthur. Um, is that an actual picture or is it a collage? And who was Ernst? Okay. That is an actual picture. And that was something that again was donated to the, uh, the museum. 
Ernst was my father's first cousin. They were very close. And Ernst uh, did make it to, to Israel. Uh, I, I don't know how Ernst and Arthur and Walter got together in that picture, but that is not a collage. It's an actual picture. And on the back of that picture, their names were written on it. So we, we've got documentation of that. That's something my father also did. Every picture on the back of it, he, he, he put notes of what it was. Amazing. Um, you and your brother, you know, went through a lot to kind of go and trace this history and stuff. What was that process like as you were traveling? Did you go to the Philippines as well? Um, actually, it was uh, uh, my brother died very young. It was my cousin Steve and I that went back uh, to Czech to the Czech Republic, and we hired a tour guide. And she was amazing. Uh, she, it turned out she was a PhD in Jewish history. So she was able to do a lot of research for us. And she was, she helped us locate the grave. She helped us uh, find Oshaline and she put us in contact with that village manager. So our agenda was really, well, let's just go back to Oshaline and visit the homeland. We had no idea that we were gonna find the house. We had no idea there was a cemetery there. We had no idea we were gonna find Alfred Rausch's stone in a memorial part of the synagogue. This all happened, including the visit to the cemetery where we found Oscar's grave. Now that research I did and found that on Google, but that was in a period of about four hours. So it was overwhelming. And when I look back, I said, I wish I would have documented a little bit more. And if you will, with some movie, with a with with the you know the eye camera, the iPhone, and and the uh, the cameras that we had. So it was very it was very emotional. There were a lot of tears, um, and, and we just felt it was very important to save these memories. Um, it helped put together the puzzle of all the pictures that we had, and it was like a jigsaw puzzle without a picture to build from. We had to put it together without a picture. It's amazing. Um, before the next question, I should let you know, there are a lot of comments saying how wonderful your presentation is and that you've done a great job and it's very informative. Thank you. So, um, one other question we have is, uh, how did you get involved with the museum and why? I credit my cousin Hannah. Um, when she retired, she did some volunteer work there. After my mother passed away, she said, you know, we have all these documents and we don't want them just to be sitting in our house when we pass away. So we decided to uh, meet with the museum uh, collections uh, professionals and see what was of interest to them. So we got together and we donated those items. And uh, as time went on, uh, I was able to find additional documents and put two and two together and donate those to the museum. So it was just something that we feel it's important for these stories to be told. And permit me to say this cautiously, we, we, the third generation isn't as interested as the second generation and as the survivors are passing away and now second generations are passing away. These stories aren't being told like they used to. And I thank, this, I thank the museum the ability to tell these stories through social media is so important because now we can preserve them and tell them for educational purposes, for schools to use them. So we feel that, and I'm going to be selfish, anybody that has got these documents, um, these uh, archival Bibles, uh, I just donated and it was very hard for me to, the, the Star of David with Ute on it. Uh, I just donated that. It was very hard to part with that, but it, it, it has to be in museums. The stories have to be told. So my cousin Steve recently passed away and uh, one of his wishes was that uh, the documents he had would also be donated to the museum. They are now sorting through his collection as well. And his first cousin, uh, cousins uh, Michael and Elena, are now also working with the museum to donate their items and to complete the story of their father, Arthur. 
And Alina actually is just in the chat and mentioned she sent you, uh, I believe, a Google album of pictures yeah. <laughs> of, from the Sherman. So yeah. um, thank you so much. Um, one other question real quick is, what do you want people to kind of take away from hearing your family story and hearing your presentation? I think the, the takeaway is that you know, several things, you know, life was good for many Europeans, not just the Jewish population. Um, that the plight of, of, of these families is so unique. Every story is unique. Many survived camps, refugee camps. My family was fortunate enough to get out, but it was still mentally very challenging for them. They went to a new home where they were very happy and very well received. And I think it's important to tell the story of how great the Philippine government was to the European Jews. Um, you know, additional takeaways. Just, stories just need to be told. That is all the questions I have. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Well, thank you everybody for your time and listening in. And uh, again, we look forward to other presentations from survivors and second generation. Please visit the museum. It's just an unbelievable educational experience. Um, so thank you again. <laughs>